Well, it seems to have um, it seems to have gone all right since then, doesn't it? Hundreds of winners later, Group One winners, broken every record on the podium of Sports Personality of the Year. That was a that was a lovely interview with Alex. Do you remember that day? Yeah, I remember that day pretty clearly. To be honest, it was. Um... A long time ago now. <laughs> oh, what did you think then about the life you were about to get into? Or oh, already were in, I suppose. Um, I just never expected I'd get to where I've got. Probably thought things were going to be a lot easier than they were back then, and I was in my own little bubble. But, um, yeah, I can't complain too much. <laughs> you definitely can't. There's 49 winners already for this calendar year. I, I just want to go back to those days, though, and, and the pony racing, because it was quite interesting. There was a... <sighs> There was a real sort of carefree spirit about the way you were talking about it. You know, just get on these ponies. It doesn't matter if they're bad. They're, it's better almost if they're naughty, bad ponies because you learn more about riding and you just hair around the outside of these jumps. <laughs> was, there, was there something about that whole world then that just gave you loads of confidence? Yeah, definitely. You know, I wasn't very successful pony racing. You know, I didn't have the best ponies. I, you know, I was lucky enough to even be, you know, in a position that my parents put me in to have a pony to, to compete in pony racing and pony club. But, um, you know, I wasn't massively successful, but it never bothered me. It didn't faze me. I was tailed off every time I rode. I was just happy to be on the back of a horse. <laughs> but there was, obviously that, there was obviously that real competitive instinct in you. I mean, but was it, was it starting off on the back foot that kind of was quietly just spurring you on? Yeah, probably. I, you know, I, I found myself in a position where I was always trying to just keep up with the rest of the lads, you know, try and be as good as the rest of them and you know maybe I, I wasn't at that stage and it took me quite a long time but um I'm glad it's it you know things were that way around you know what I didn't realize is that where there were two branches well, until I re listened to that interview with Alex that there were two branches of the pony racing sport on the point-to-point -point branch you you didn't they didn't equalize the weights no. So, so you were you were a bit of an advantage. I still had to be a fair. full stone advantage, and I still used to be tailed off most of the time. <laughs> um, but I, I did ride a few winners. I was lucky enough. I um, loaned a nice little pony from um, Alison and Nick Champion. I think Sam Tristan Davies actually had her before me, and I rode a few winners on her. Um, she was a mini racehorse, so we had a few you know a few funny tales. I I grew up riding a kick along pony that I couldn't get out of a trot, and used to bury me every every day to ride in this. Um, this little filly that couldn't hold one side of, <laughs> um, so she taught me, taught me well. <laughs> but those, yeah, those of us who've, who've, who've ridden as kids, you go one way or the other. You, know, you either get put off by those sort of experiences, or they just make you want more and more and more of them. Was it always the the latter with you? Yeah, definitely. I I didn't seem to be phased by much, um, <laughs> which is a bit worrying. But um, yeah, I just get on with it really, and you know, my parents were pretty, you know, used to let me get on with things and do what I want. I was never pushed into doing anything or held back, really. So there was never a feeling from them as you were growing up, oh, you've got to do this, we want you to be a rider, sort of fulfil our dreams, if you like, from, from our day? No, not at all. I mean, they both rode, so I was influenced by what they did and but I was never pushed into anything or, you know, told what to do. I kind of made my own decisions <laughs> and they supported that. I'm fascinated to know how your success, but, I mean, and especially the profile in the last year, how, how that's impacted on, on the family and how they've, how they've responded to it. Oh, yeah, I think, um, you know, especially my dad, I'm kind of living his, his dream. You know, he, he, he rode on the flat. He was actually apprenticed to Richard Hannon, which is where I did my apprenticeship. So um, now I'm just glad to be making them feel proud and... You know, they support me so much, so I'm very lucky. Was that one of the reasons why you went to Richard's? Was it, did you want to follow in, in his um, first steps? Well, I, I started off, obviously, with Dave Evans. Mm. Um, it was really convenient. He was only just over an hour away from where I was brought up in Herefordshire, so it wasn't too far from home, and I got a real good grounding there, <laughs> so you can imagine, and rode Dave a few winners and, you know, learnt the basics, and then I needed to take the, you know, next step as such, and, um, you know, Tom was already at... Richards yeah um so it just you know just I just fell into a position there and you know just went there with no real I don't know I just went there without knowing what was going to happen really I was either gonna it was either gonna make or break me and luckily it worked out well <laughs> it's quite funny I mean Tom's obviously been riding in Australia and, and I guess comes he come back this week um he comes back tomorrow morning yeah, yeah. Uh, and and 
people talk about how you, you, know, you complement each other and you have slightly sort of different personalities, different styles. But the one thing that's always struck me about talking to both of you is how you both seized an opportunity kind of out of nowhere as early as you possibly could. And you were saying, in, in, in that, you just, you just pack your bag when you were 16 and that's it. You're off to Dave Evans. You both got that incredible sort of independence at a very, at a very young age. Were you always quite a kind of, were you that sort of person? Yeah, I suppose we're both quite s similar in that regard. If we want to do something, we'll do it, whether it's together or <laughs> alone, as you can tell by Tom, yeah. <laughs> Tom's actions over the last few years. But, um, yeah, I mean, sometimes you've got to be a bit selfish and you've got to do things to help yourself out. Um, so, you know, every opportunity you get, you've got to take it with both hands. But you, you, know, you know what I'm getting at, don't you? Because I'm thinking of myself at 16. I don't know what you were like, but you just, right, that's what I'm going to do. Off I go, and also put yourself in a yard that is not going to immediately thrust you to stardom. Yeah, I think that that's what comes across, isn't it, with people who are successful. You tend to forget some of the challenges you've had along the way, and it's that phrase, isn't it, feel the fear and do it anyway. Mm. You know, it's almost as if that desire to succeed or just take your chance and, and run with it. For me, I suppose it was going to Hong Kong, when just after I was getting established here, thinking, well, if I didn't do it, I'd always sit back and think, why didn't I give it a go? So... But it, it can be hard. You can be, you know, when you're on your own in a new environment, five days in, having fallen off one, yeah. must, must quite quite a strength of character. Yeah, that's it. I've always kind of believed in if something's not working, you've got to change it. And um, that's kind of how I've, you know, played my cards over the last few years. But I suppose, you know, rewind five years back, I was quite happy in a comfort zone, um, you know, just day in, day out doing what I do. But over, you know, recently, any opportunity I've been offered or anything that's come up, I really need to take with both hands now. Were you always very self-critical in, in terms of your actual ability as a rider? Was that, does that go back all the way, or is that something that's developed over the last few years? Um, no, I've always been the same, really. Um, something I wish I wasn't as bad with, but it prob I probably wouldn't be in this position if I wasn't like that mentally. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I like it works that. for me, but maybe not others. <laughs> yeah, but it's important. You need to exist with yourself on a day to day basis, set yourself challenges, but not beat yourself up if it doesn't work. But I'm interested in what you're saying about when you're in your comfort zone. That obviously wasn't enough. No, it wasn't enough. And when you're in your comfort zone, it's you know easy and things weren't working out, so I had to change it. <laughs> isn't, it isn't it working out that you're in the comfort zone? If that's the thing. It's identifying the fact that there's something you just just not quite satisfied by it. You know? Yeah, I think it took me long enough to get to where I've got to, but now I've realised staying at this level is even harder. Um, mm. So that's why you've got to keep pushing yourself and trying to be better and, you know, go as far as you can. And also, I guess, when you've, you've ridden so many winners as you did last year, you've had all those accolades, you've ridden at the, at the highest level and you've had Group 1 winners. Do you feel now that you're going to be scrutinised through a slightly different lens? So people are looking at you, they're not looking at you as, oh, great, Holly Doyle, she had 100 winners. They're looking at you, right, well, um, how's she cutting it in a Group 1 race here? How's she cutting it in the elite? Yeah, that's it. I mean, over the last few years, I've, you know, ridden many winners each year, but um, I think I'm at that stage now where people are looking into the um, class of races in which I'm winning, which is really important to try and get on that better type of horse, which over the last year or so, I've been really lucky and that has been happening. But um, like I said, you've got to keep pushing forward to keep things rolling. I mean, it's, it's, all, it's, self, it's evident to all of us that it, you, you've driven your, your career brilliantly. But I'm really interested to know Dave Evans, Richard Hannan, Archie Watson. I don't think there are three more different types of, <laughs> types of people. What would you say each of them has contributed to, to the Holly Doyle we see riding now? Um, massively, really. I mean, at Dave's, I was very young and immature. I wasn't a great rider, but he you know, taught me the basics, gave me a good grounding, um, didn't let me get above myself and kept me level-headed. Um, I suppose at Richard's I was, you know, made a rider of me, really. I, you know, riding those yearlings all winter, um, you know, makes or breaks you. And, you know, I really loved it there and um, had such a, such a good few years. And, um, you know, I can't even explain as an apprentice the amount of opportunities you get and how much you learn from being around good jockeys and good horses and you know good people um, so that was a huge you know contributor and obviously then I made the move to Archie's who who was um, you know a massive pivotal point in my career because 
I went there with no claim. Mm. So when you le when I lost my claim, I could have, you know, stayed with Richard, which you know I still have a good connection with, and still ride out there every now and then. But um, you know, got to sit back and assess the situation I was in. You know, at Dex, am I going to be at the at the front of their mind when they've got the likes of Sean Levy, Pat Dobbs, Ryan Moore? Probably not. <laughs> um, so Archie was willing to give me opportunities, which. I've taken with both hands. And, and and you caught somebody on the up as well, and he caught That's you it, on the yeah. up, and it's like perfect timing. He, I mean, I don't know Archie Watson that well. He's obviously massively successful. I chat to him occasionally. He's very intense, isn't he? A very driven guy. Yeah, he's very driven. He knows what he wants. He knows what he wants to achieve with each horse. He has a campaign. He'll have a campaign planned for every two-year-old, and he yeah. hasn't even run yet. And, um, no, he's just very ambitious. But one thing he is is he's very loyal um, and I think to be um, connected with someone such as Archie who's very loyal it's um, you know it's great as a jockey. <laughs> mm. So you, you, you feel that he's got total trust in you? Um, yeah I suppose yeah. we've built up a good relationship over the last few years we've had some great results and you know I know the horse is inside out so I go out there with plenty of confidence and hopefully he has confidence in me so it's a good team. It's, a, it's actually not dissimilar to the way that Henry de Bromhead was talking about the way that he and Rachel Blackmore have built up their partnership over the over the last few years. I, I don't know if you were, you were listening to some of their interviews last weekend. Yeah, I suppose it sounds not dissimilar. Um, but you know, I suppose one thing in a working relationship relationship like that is trust. You know, mm. the trainer's got to trust their jockey, and you know, I've got to have trust within the horse and the trainer. So um, without that, I mean, you know. You, you wouldn't be having a lot of success, would you? But you're, as you say, you don't want to feel comfortable. You, you don't want to feel in any kind of comfort zone. So how this year, since the turn of the year, if you like, have you tried to kind of strike out of that circle again? Um, well, obviously, at the back end of the year last year, I managed to get a retained job with Imad al Sagar, so I took that with both hands, and we've had some great results, um, you know, at such an early stage within that job and I hope you know going forward this year um, will be another good year um, obviously with my success from Archie and um, a lot of other trainers have started using me and mm. I just don't want trainers to have a reason not to use me you need to give them every reason to want to use you so that's the uh, aim. Uh, I mean Richard that that is the that is the challenge, isn't it? When you get to you get to that that level where you're you're considered part of the the absolute elite, it's to stay there. Oh, definitely. Um, at the same time, I'm interested in you know whether the dynamic of what's happening with jockeys riding at one meeting this year you know, really does give you an opportunity to have the jockey's title as a realistic aspiration. Because as you say, if you think about other riders that are tied to contracts which mean they'll have to ride at the feature yeah. meeting. We saw Brian Hughes eke out you know, six or seven winners by avoiding Aintree, etc. You won't be avoiding those meetings at all. You'll still be riding at them regularly, but you'll also potentially, as you say, have the groundswell of support if you want to go to Wolverhampton on a, on a Wednesday and have a you know, good book of rides, so that, that might help. Yeah, that's it. I suppose with this one meeting rule, last year I, I was you know, in a good position and I found myself riding for a lot of different trainers and picking up spare rides um, that I definitely wouldn't have picked up the year before if they had their retained riders at that meeting. So, I mean, some jockeys like myself, it probably it prob it's probably in favour, but others maybe not. Mm. And you talked about um, Tom's winning in a day but, uh, um, a little while ago when we were talking to William Haggs at the beginning of the programme. Uh, he's been, how long has he been away now? Um, he left at the middle of, in the middle of February. Because, so as he said, it's a, that's quite, it's quite it's a big it's a big commitment that isn't it to to go to go and do that and then and to have to do all the hotel quarantine and all the rest of it. Did he did he have any any sort of qualms about going or did you just say look you've got to go and do this? Oh no, there was you know it wasn't questioned you know him going there or not. He was gone you know after the success they had last year. Um, it was a no-brainer, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, I guess, I, I guess it was. And uh, have you have you found it difficult in the in the interim, or not really? Um, I think this year's been fine. Obviously, I've been really busy myself. Last year wasn't nice because we were in lockdown, obviously, um, so we were all shut in with nothing to do. But I suppose over the, you know, last few years, I've got used to it and you know matured a bit, thankfully. So no, I'm fine with it. <laughs> and uh, is is 
working more internationally something you'd like to kind of add this year would that be a, would that be a big goal for you oh yeah for sure i want to ride anywhere i can and i've had a few little trips this year in and out only but i've never done a stint somewhere um recently i'd love to give somewhere a go yeah absolutely um richard just sort of reflecting on on some of you know holly's great successes last year um i think whenever racing gets recognized on a on a wider stage as it was with the with the bbc sports personality of the year is it is a significant moment for the sport and again obviously we've seen it again in the in the last week you know writ large yeah we do and there's this trade-off between i fully understand from holly and rachel's everyone's perspective you're just jockeys we all you know mm. but outside the wider context of course there's a bigger issue of you know equality and female participation and success in sport which means that it is the reason that the focus will be on there and i think both of you have handled it really well because you're both very likable i'm interested if you were both quite slow burn if you like and i wonder if that that sort of helps because rachel herself you know possibly more experienced than people think and had a couple of years when she didn't ride loads of winners and that persistence and the fitness angle from your side i know is is an area you really seem to to latch on to and, and believe that that could be an area you could improve? Yeah, definitely. I mean, obviously being a bit of a slow burner, I managed to sit back and watch the do's and don'ts, really, and, um, you know, have had longer to develop as a rider, maybe maybe tactically, you know, sat back and watched people's mistakes and learnt from them and my own as well. So, um, no, I've managed to realise over the last few years what it takes to kind of get to where I've got, maybe. What did you think watching... The national. Oh, that was amazing. <laughs> it was amazing, yeah. I mean, I said earlier, I, I was fixated by Rachel the whole way around, just praying and watching her, but you could call her a winner a long way out. She was just you, you in such actually, a great yeah. rhythm. You, but both of you, actually, it's something that's both very common. It's strange as a commentator, you, you don't recognise many riders, but you do recognise confidence. You do recognise someone who's happy and content yeah. with the way they are, and that was evident from an early stage. Over two out, you looked at Rachel and thought, well, you're not going to go too early, you're not going to panic. You've travelled so well to this point. You might not stay, but it's not going to be you that, that loses it. And you have a similar poise, if you like. You can see your thought process through a race. You feel comfortable out there, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I feel most content when I'm on the back of a horse, to be honest. Um, I don't know why, but it's just... <laughs> uh, there was a, a very interesting article in the Sunday Times today that... Um, is, is more interesting than a lot of the articles that are written about how women can succeed and can succeed in a man's world, or or, you know, tr or sort of articles that reinforce gender stereotypes. It was, it was talking a lot about the, the sort of sports actually where where women could get an edge over their their male counterparts, and talked about racing as as one of them um, because of the the attributes that that are needed and the fact that you know the fact that. Quite often, your your weight is very stable as well. Yours is, and you know, you, you you can you can approach it mentally and tactically, in a way that could give you a, a significant advantage. Yeah, possibly. I've never really looked at it that way, but um, yeah, I mean, I I obviously haven't got a weight problem. Neither has Rachel. Whether that's something that's, you know, um, your commitment know. to fitness, though, we shouldn't mm. underestimate. I mean, it, it is a it. big. I mean, just fill us in on how we, you know, everyone flies around the country, drives here, there, and everywhere. How long would you spend? in the gym as, as part of your regular sort of preparation? Um, well, in the winter, obviously, we were going to evening meetings, so I was going there most days when I could after I'd ridden out, but obviously at the moment it's getting busier, so it's when I can get really, when I've got the time, but um, I like to work hard in the winter to kind of get a good base to set me off for the summer, but um, it's something that I enjoy doing, you know, I'm not saying that everyone needs to do this, you know, maybe people don't enjoy it, but I actually enjoy it, and it's good, you know, mentally to feel strong and know that you are strong. <laughs> yeah, there's a fantastic clip from last year of you doing things that are... <laughs> no, it's just My mind was off. boggling how you jump from yeah. here to here with, yeah. with both feet. So you, do you, is that another thing where you just like really enjoy challenging yourself and pushing yourself as hard as you can? Yeah, definitely. I've always been pretty athletic and um, competitive and it's something that I've always been pretty passionate about. You know, if I wasn't a jockey, I'd probably do some other sport, but uh, it's something I enjoy and... You know the things I do. I don't know how much of an impact they have on my riding, but I feel like they, they help. <laughs> and did you, did you, could you identify a point where you you sort of just felt more comfortable on a racehorse? Um, um, because you know you often talk about oh, I was not I wasn't any good when I started, and you know I, I wasn't where I wanted to be. Could you sort of identify a, a turning point, a, a tipping point? Yeah, I suppose everyone will probably say the same thing. With the more rides I got, the more comfortable I felt. You know, it's 
So it's amazing how much I've learned over the last few years and how much more there is still to find out and learn and you can never stop learning, can you? And that's the attitude, isn't it? You're, you're quite sponge-like, I sense. You look around you and see what, <laughs> what you can gain from other, from, from other people. You might discard it, you might look and think, well, no, actually it wouldn't suit me, but I get the impression that your brain's always searching for something that can help you. Yeah, my brain doesn't really switch off very well, so I'm always kind of trying to take everything in and, you know, in, in, indulge things that, you know, might be helpful for myself. <laughs> yeah, you, you've said before that you're, you're not a good sleeper, that you, you, <laughs> you turn stuff over and over and over and over and over in your mind. Have you, are, you, are you getting better? I'm, you know, I don't really... Um, I don't know, I'm just quite a buzzy person, maybe I don't stop thinking, but I wouldn't be one that would go home and be disappointed with how the results have turned out or how the days turned out. I'm not really like that. It's just I'm just I'm just quite a buzzy person, I suppose. <laughs> so you can you can like flush it away. Oh yeah, I and you know, as long as I know I've done what I can, I written to my instructions or I've given the horse the best possible chance. Yeah, it's disappointing if something doesn't work out or a horse has run below par, but at the end of the day, if you've covered all the aspects that needed covering, then there's not a lot you can do about it. So I always just think there's worse things going on in the world than worrying about But I suppose stuff. that's the hard part, is the other side of it. Which is the same. You just wish you'd done something different. Are you good at coping with that? Um, yeah, I just... Yeah, I don't know, really. It's something that if you've done something wrong, I tend to come in and say, listen, I shouldn't have done that, I should have done this, or, you know... I, I, you know, hold my hands up, really. It's not something that I try to cover up. Mm. If you've done wrong, you should just admit. <laughs> and I think that's, that's another interesting thing, particularly now, and, and the, the, the way that a lot of top-class sports people sort of, as we talked about at the beginning of the interview, are very self-critical, very self-analytical, and obviously their capacity to analyse has got much, much greater because everything's covered in, in, in that much more depth. I suppose there's a balance between that and being able to push on to the next day. And racing's relentlessness, um, I guess, doesn't allow you to dwell too much, does it? That's it. I mean, you've got half an hour between races. You can feel on top of the world one minute, and then half an hour later, you could feel like you're at rock bottom. But um, it's something that you become resilient um, towards, I suppose. And it, what, what strikes me is you, you don't seem to have let the attention get to you too much, that you seem to be able to cope with the, the, the much greater level of media attention uh, OK. How, how was that towards the, the end of last year with the...? <laughs> um, I'm probably not the best in front of a camera, but it's something that, you know, I'm trying to work on, but maybe I'm not getting much better, but it's something I don't find comes very natural to me, but as long as the riding's going all right, I don't mind. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure I agree, to be honest. No, I, I think you, you, you almost struggle, I suppose, in a way to... To sort of, you know, believe your own success in a way. It comes across that that's very endearing, to be honest, rather than... Yeah, I can't... Uh, yeah, I do struggle to get my head around it sometimes, but it's something that I've always dreamt of achieving, but whether I believed I could do it or not is a different story. <laughs> yeah, I suppose accepting, as you were talking about, the, you know, the riding at the very level, you can probably accept it on a horse racing front in terms of, you know, you know the horses, they're running group ones, I'm going to ride them. I suppose the external side of the attention that... That has followed possibly might be almost harder to understand. Yeah, definitely. You know, like I said, I'm most confident on the back of a horse, and I'm quite tunnel visioned. You know, all I want to do is ride, and I'm probably not. I don't really take in, into consideration the things that come along with it as much as other people. Hmm. <laughs> and so, and so for 2021, I mean, is it is it obvious what your goals are, or? Are there things that you've got in your own head that you really like to achieve that perhaps we wouldn't have considered? Um, I don't really set specific goals as such. I just want to keep on improving, ride at the highest level I possibly can, and you know improve on last year year's tally. Uh, which I think is what. And so, how many was it at the end last year? One hundred and fifty-one. Yeah. One hundred fifty-one. Um, that is, I would say, eminently doable, given that you're <laughs> a third of the way there already. And the transition as well between the quality... You know, we get people saying that transitionary careers, the quality of races, more yeah. group successes as well. Yeah, we'll have to see. You know, I've, I'm lucky enough to... We've got a, a few nice horses um, to, to send out this year, so you never know. <laughs> uh, who's going to be your star this year? Um, 
the star this year. I'm just really looking forward. Obviously, it's a no-brainer for me, but I'm just looking forward to getting back back on Glen Shiel. <laughs> um, you know what you achieved last year it was mind-blowing, and you never know what what's more to come. And that was a classic example of you believing in a horse that uh, maybe the rest of us sort of thought we'd we'd pigeonhole somewhere else. Yeah, definitely. You know, and not so much me, but Archie. You know, fair yeah. play to him. You know, we got that horse. Um, and he was running over 10 furlongs and Archie kept stepping him back and back in trip. And, um, I mean, the day I was second in Haydock in the, in the Sprint Cup, I was mind blown. I, I felt like I'd won. Um, you know, I had, had many Group 1 rides and I felt like I'd won. And for him to go and win on Champions Day, it's just <laughs> crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully there'll be many more big days. When these sprinters get going, then they can just they can keep delivering at the highest level. Holly, thanks so much for chatting to us.